Thanks very much. Choosing a winning variety at seeding is one that growers grapple with. And misquoting from George Orwell, all varieties are equal, but some varieties are more equal than others. And what we're saying is that management can have a really big impact on how more equal those varieties become. So I can put that in another way for you. Oh, oops. <laughs> this is me. I'm Christine Zako Kanesh. I'm not 50, uh, and I'm a woman, and there are many women out here that are my equal. But with better management, yes, I could have looked like that. Um, I was, someone suggested I had some other photos I could have put up there, which, which might have been a bit more risque. Um, okay, so for 23 years I've worked in the grains industry and the last 12 in the Wheat Agronomy Project. The, the project is focused on providing growers with support to choose and manage varieties. Um, and we're doing agronomic research that uh, is focused on management and risk. I'm part of a team. And the team includes Ben Curtis, Brenda Shackley, Kevin Young, Muhammad Amjad, Bob French, Mario Giantonio, and Chad Reynolds. We also have a really strong technical support team that support us. Our project, we're really proud of a number of products. The, the Flower Power tool is one that's out there, that's, and we've seen an increase in access of that tool by 15% over the last, uh, since its inception in its first year and the second year of um, accessing flower power to help growers identify the risk factors um, with, and, and looking at the maturity of that variety um, and choice of the variety with um, frost risk, I should say. Uh, the Wheat Variety Guide is another document that really houses a lot of the information on the characteristics of the varieties and the, and the disease resistance ratings. It's available um, in the post through GRDC's uh, grow a direct um, online and, and online as well in March um, and that's another tool that we're very proud of. I also just wanted to point out that we do a, a really comprehensive R&D program and the work that we do has, we've, we've uh, touched base with work on competitiveness of varieties, looking at disease management with the new varieties, um, the sprouting index, the falling number index that uh, Kevin Young talked about last year, that's part of that R&D program and also, as I mentioned, getting a good understanding on the phenology of the varieties that underpins the flower power model. Okay, so the wheat industry is a $2 billion industry, and Kevin, oh, sorry, and uh, Peter this morning put on some, um, a similar sort of uh, diagram here. There's about over 29 varieties represent nearly 100% of the cropped area, but there is about 80% of the state's cropped um, area are sown to the top six varieties. And the, the big, big story here that you can see is that there's, there's been a, his, a meteoric adoption of mace since its inception four years ago. Um, and I don't think we most, we most probably haven't seen the adoption of a variety as, as, as quickly and to that level of extent at greater than 50%, um, you know, maybe since, the, you know, since Federation. Uh, really been at the decline of wild catchem, um, and the other varieties there, Kalingri, Yipi, and Stiletto, have all uh, maintained, and we're seeing a, 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 a wavering and maintaining of their um, adoption across the state. And Cobra and Korak, as um, you can see here, we're just starting to see them come into the industry. And there's a suite of new varieties that'll be coming through too. So the focus of what I'm wanting to do today is to really support you with some knowledge and skills so that you can choose for your client and alongside your clients um, the, the varieties that are winners in your system. I'll be touching base on long season environments, the wheat on wheat system, but at the moment what I want to talk about with you is using the NVT information to help us with understanding varieties um, and, and the systems that uh, the NVT trial program help us to identify uh, the, you know, in terms of um, managing varieties. So I've titled this Varieties Based on um, the Date at the Break. Now, NVT Online provides you with trial data from a trial within a location. It also gives you benchmarking of that variety against the site mean. Last year, Kevin did some work that showed you how you can benchmark varieties against another variety and, uh, from the NVT database, and that's the, the uh, and, and Peter today did uh, something similar. Um, with some of the um, um, information that he provided. But 
and this and this is and this is what we were talking about here, where we look at benchmarking variety A against variety B, and if if the trials in the NVTs over a number of years are above that one-to-one -one line, then you would say that that variety is outperforming variety B as the benchmark. So that's the type of um, level of understanding that we have at the moment with the NVTs. But what are the factors that have made these trial, this variety at this trial, at these trials, perform better than variety B? How can we get, use the NVT database to help us get some kind of an understanding on how varieties um, respond to the environment? Sowing time, uh, rainfall, uh, previous crop, soil pH, all of these kinds of factors is information that the NVT database collects. Can we use that information to help give our clients a much better knowledge on the risk factors and the performance of those varieties? Okay, so I've got a series of graphs that will be um, looking like this, and I'll just walk you through this first one, and then we'll be able to roll through with a second. Okay, so what I have here is in Ag Zone 2, a uh, comparison here of mace minus wild catchum. So this is the yield difference between mace and wild catchum. A positive value is telling you that mace has performed better than wild catchum. A negative value is showing you that wild catchum has outperformed mace. Now, the, so the NVTs, in essence, are sown very close to the break of the season, within a couple of weeks of the break of the season. And so this is the date of sowing of the NVTs in Ag Zone 2 between 2007 and 2012. Now, there's some colour coding on here as well. Now, what I mentioned to you before is we want to look at the factors that have, a, um, have influenced the performance of a variety against a benchmark variety. What you're seeing here is our red, black and blue represent growing season rainfall. And when you look at, the, um, look at this, uh, this uh, diagram, what it's really indicating to you is that mace has shown a really wide adaption across a range of showing, sowing times in Ag Zone 2. What you can see is that there's, there's a greater number of times that mace has outperformed wild catchum. Moving on to our next comparison. This is Cobra versus Wild Catchem again in Ag Zone 2. So all the trials are at Ag Zone 2, or all the maps that I'm showing you are at Ag Zone 2. And what you can see here, and there was a gentleman this morning that asked a question about Cobra's performance in a dry environment. Well, this is some statistical, and, and the analysis that we've done has been st is statistically based, I should say. It's not just about looking at it and, and a, a visual, because the visual is very strong, but we also do have some stati st statistical analysis that supports the findings too. So what you can see here is that in those high rainfall environments, so that's the high and medium, the black and the blue dots, the crosses and the triangles, Cobra has outperformed wild catchum in the, um, in the higher rainfall environments. We've got more cases of where Cobra has performed better in the high and the medium rainfall than it has in the low rainfall environments. You can also see here, if you think of the 30th of May, as a cutoff point, that Cobra has performed, there's more, there's more chances or more, more cases where Cobra has outperformed Wild Catchem um, when it's sown before the 30th of May compared to the, after um, the 30th of May. Our next comparison is magenta, and we get the similar story between Cobra and magenta in those high. Uh, uh, so when we're looking at um, sowing time as the, um, once again, as the, as the cutoff there, there are actually more cases of where magenta has performed better than wild catchum before the 30th of May. And we've also seen that it's in those higher rainfall environments. There's more of the, the, the high and medium rainfall environments where magenta's performed better, whereas you see there's a lot more of the low rainfall environments where magenta has not performed quite so well. 
and 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 uh, that's um, showing uh, that's giving you another representation of the rainfall um, influence on magenta's performance. Okay, the final comparison I was I'm going to provide you is the Corax story, um, and what you can see here is that really in Ag Zone Four. Cobra and in Exone uh, One as well, as an example, Cobra, sorry, Corac has outperformed um, Wild Catchem in the NVT uh, trial program across a range of sowing times. Now, when we look at these, this information, it's really valuable to see how they respond across the environments and in the NVTs, but it's also important to think about the risk factors of those varieties. And as was discussed um, and is um, uh, Korak is an example, powdery mildew and staining are, are risks for that environment. So you need to be thinking about in terms of the sowing time of that variety and the risk factors of that variety when you lo start looking at the sowing time and the rainfall locations that you choose. And if, if they are risks to your environment, uh, then you will be needing to look to manage your sowing time or, or, or changing your variety selection. And the, similar, and the similar story is with magenta as well. Uh, and Cora, uh, uh, Cobra as well, in terms of their, their um, falling number indexes are quite a, a risky, and so looking at those high rainfall environments, those varieties would be in where um, sprouting is a risk to your environment may not be the choice of, for you in those, in those high rainfall long season environments. Okay, so that's some new studies that we've undertaken in the last uh, few months and we'd like to continue that work by, and we will be wanting to include the 2013 data. It's really, a, it, you know, it's a long process to manage this information and so our next steps will be to looking to include the 2013 data and, and looking at other benchmark varieties. You, the, uh, the paper itself actually has a table representation of this information um, to give you some better skills to help your growers deciding on the varieties which perform better before or after the 30th of May, and also um, in terms of whether you're seeing the, um, those varieties that perform better across the whole sowing time. Okay. Now moving on, what wheat on wheat? My rough calculation is that about 80% of the varieties sown in 2013 were what I would have called a low to medium risk for leaf disease. And it's a really, um, it's, it's a, um, uh, you know, what I'm trying to say here is that the, the breeding companies have really taken on board the opportunities to manage for, uh, or, or to breed into their new varieties, better disease resistances for the rusts and along the way, we're seeing better leaf disease, uh, we're seeing better resistances to the, um, the septorias and the yellow spots um, as well. So that's a, the industry is, is really, moving, really moving forward in a strong way. But there are varieties that you would consider at risk to growing in, the high, um, in, in those high rainfall, high risk situations where um, wheat, if you're looking to adopt wheat on wheat. So what I want to do now is I'm going to just go through a series of, just give you a snapshot of the different um, uh, wheat groups. And, and when you look at the, that, that snapshot, you can see where the high risk varieties are or the lower risk varieties are. Okay, so I just want to touch base on the clearfield lines. So the clearfield lines are you know, obviously weed control options, um, but the disease profile for those varieties are high are risky because they do have that yellow spot in Septorian adorum. So if you're looking at using these varieties in those environments on a wheat on wheat system, you really need to manage for your fungicide applications and going in on that 30, with Zadok 31 and potentially with a follow up as well. So if you want to get the best out of those clear field lines, budgeting for fungicide is really important. In terms of the Australian hard wheats, you can see here we have some Varieties which have got the medium risk. So I should uh, outline, I'm sorry, I should have gone back a step. Um, in the wheat variety guide, we've got a table in there that, that gives you the resistance ratings of the varieties. It's a stop, we've also color coded in a, um, a, a traffic light system where green uh, are low risk varieties, They're, they've got the good resistances. Amber, 
which is what we have here, this yellow colour, are the medium resistance ratings. Their ratings are in that medium zone. And then the, the ones which have got better resistances are the green ones the, with the traffic lights. Um, and so you'll see that there are varieties that are coming through which have got that green traffic light system, which are, are lower risk varieties to your system. So what you're seeing here in the, um, media, uh, in the AHs, there are some varieties that are coming through. If leaf disease, and leaf disease is a risk system in the wheat on wheat system, there are varieties that do have um, um, lower resistances to those leaf diseases. And so really, if you're looking to select those varieties in, in, in a high risk environment like a wheat on wheat system, fungicide is really important, managing the, manage the leaf disease, but also considering swapping other varieties if, if you see that, or looking at stubble management options as well to reduce that risk. In terms of the APWs, that's where we start to see better resistances to the yellow spots in the, and, um, in the um, APWs. And I guess when you think about the APWs, uh, sorry, in a wheat on wheat system, protein is something that might be um, needing to be managed. And so the APWs are a, a better option in that environment because you've got some which have got better disease resistances and, and the protein story is, not as, um, is, is much easier to manage. Okay, so now I'm wanting to move on to the next level of conversation, which I mentioned was the long season wheats. What we're wanting to really think about in the long season wheats are the options to make rain from grain. Early sowing provides that opportunity for, for um, spreading your frost risks, provides you with the opportunity to go in early and get the crop in the ground and get a much, grower, a much bigger cropping area in there. And that, that can make a lot of money to the industry. OK. So we're looking at, if yet P is our benchmark variety for those long season environments, what we're looking for are varieties that have got a phenology, that have got a, a length of maturity that is similar to yip pea. So do we have some of those varieties coming through? So I want to acknowledge Brenda Shackley and Kevin Young, colleagues of mine who have, have got the information through from some research work that was done last year. And I should also point out this phenology data has been, um, we've been collecting phenology data for um, many, many years. And it's this information that you're seeing here that helps to underpin what goes into flower power. But what you can see here is uh, our suite of varieties. I've selected the longer maturing varieties in this um, uh, table. Um, and this is the days from Yip P. This was sown on the 26th of April. So we do um, hill plot trials and where they're single row um, um, trials of a metre where we, we sow the varieties at four times throughout the year. Um, and then we look at and, and record the, the, the development and the flowering time and heading dates of these varieties. So this is a snapshot from one of the time of sowings last year. But what you can see here is that there's no variety that's longer than yet pea. We have two locations, Catanning and Esperance. So the blue is Catanning and the light blue is Esperance. Now the yet pea sown here flowered at Catanning on the 5th of September and at Esperance on the 31st of August. And what you can see here is that these locations and the, the, the heat sums and the cold sums and, and the, the temperature in those environments has an influence on when those varieties flower. So what you can see here is it took longer um, for, sorry, Trojan, Magenta and Estoc were quite a bit quicker than Yip Pea when they were sown at Catanning. At Esperance, Harper and Estoc and you know, Magenta as well were between two and three days earlier than Yip Pea. So they're not as long as Yip Pea, but they are in the realms of being close to um, the maturity of Yip Pea. I guess the next question when we look at the long season wheats is the disease, um, you know, the, the, high, uh, you know, the long, weeks, long season provides the opportunity for disease to become a problem within the system. Um, I'm just touching on um, three diseases here in terms of yellow spot, powdery mildew, 
sorry, two diseases, and then falling number index as well. And uh, that's why we've seen a really, you know, big use of mace and adoption of mace and YIP in the system because they have slightly, you know, different maturities, but they do have that amber. So um, I've call, I've, we, we've, we're call, calling that an amber mature, um, amber level of um, tolerance to falling number um, index. And if you want a bit more of an understanding about that falling number index, Kevin presented that at the crop updates two years ago. Okay, so here we go with S-Doc, and I haven't, had, I haven't mentioned S-Docs too much here, but what you can see is that S-Doc's actually got a green light for falling number index. So from a sprouting perspective, this variety provides you with better um, or reduces your risk that sprouting is going to impact on the quality of your grain. You need to then look at the, that variety in terms of its performance within the district in those long season environments. And just touch now on Harper as another new wheat that's come through the system. As I mentioned, it's um, got that maturity a little bit longer, or, or not quite as long as Yip um, With this variety, the, the caution here is that it does have a, a, a red light when it comes to the leaf diseases and powdery mildew. So they're things that need to be managed and budgeted for. In those long season environments, um, managing um, you know, what are the management factors that need to be considered? And I've talked about the resistance ratings of the varieties can help you to reduce the risk that leaf disease is going to impact on your crop's production. But also um, fungicides are a part of that and that, that need to be budgeted for. And we've just got some information here that show, uh, that's um, uh, some trial work that Kevin did last year at Esperance. It was done at two locations, Gibson and Newtigert, but I'm just presenting the Gibson data because um, we actually saw disease come into the, the crop here at Gibson. We didn't get that level of infection at um, Newtigert, oh, sorry, at um, Gibson. Sorry, salmon guns, I think. Okay, so, I, ooh. Okay, so this trial, we're looking at the, the impact of fungicides. Thanks. The impact of fungicides on the performance of a range of the longer maturing lines here. It was sown on the 2nd of May. Now the interesting thing here is it was onto canola stubble. And what you can see here is that the fungicide treatments in red have provided a real yield benefit to the performance of these varieties at Gibson in 2013. This is on canola stubble and so that's a really good break crop opportunity to get the best out of that crop but we've still seen some value from using the fungicides. And Kevin has commented that when you actually go and look under the canopy, there was actually cereal stubble still under the canopy. Um, and so that's why it's really important to be thinking about the risk factors and, make, and looking at what level of um, stubble's there from previous years as to whether that pro provides a, a, a disease risk for you. And when you look at the amount of rain that we had last year, we've seen that level of um, rain really encouraging leaf disease in 2013. I just want to finish off with a couple of the one-to-one -one ratios, the benchmarking against um, uh, um, be benchmarking the new varieties against a benchmark variety. So in this case, in the long season environments, we're thinking about Harper versus Yip Pea. Now, this is just 2013 data over a range of ag zones for Harper. So we've got the Harper zone uh, here on the y-axis and Yip Pea here on the x-axis and the one-to-one -one line. So above the one-to-one -one line, and you'd be saying this, the variety's performed better than its benchmark variety. But what, what you're seeing here with Harper is, when Yip is a benchmark, it's performed reasonably similar to Yip Pea. Now we must remember that these trials are part of the NVT, and in 2013, they weren't sown really early in early, early May. They were sown in the second and third weeks of May. Um, and frost, well, there wasn't really a frost expression last year that put these varieties under risk. But this just gives you a bit of an understanding of how Harper, as a comparison to Yip Pea, is, it, you know, it, it is giving Yip Pea a run for its money. But when you look at it compared to Mace, you're seeing here that there are more situations where Harper has performed poorer than Mace as a benchmark. So if you're looking potentially to be replacing Yip Pea, Harper might be something that'll come down the track, but this is only one year of data in 2013. When we look at Trojan versus Yip Pea, 
what you're seeing is it's performed much, much better than, well, uh, than YPI in 2013 and 2012. When we use MACE as our benchmark, there have been cases where it has performed better than, Troj uh, than MACE, but there are also cases where it's performed poorer than MACE. Okay, so thanks very much. I've just got a couple of messages I just want to summarise here for you. Okay, the first is that MACE is king. We've seen such a rapid adoption because it does have a really good adoption, a, a really good um, um, expression or, or good yield potential, yield production across a range of environments, across a lot of ag zones. But you can still make your other varieties winners. Thinking about how they perform in rainfall areas, uh, rainfall and, and, and sowing time as well, as was expressed earlier on. We're looking to make sure that there are some options to turn our rain into grain, and there are, those options are starting to improve. So there's some good light coming along. Now, there's some publicity early on in the season about the new rust, uh, a leaf rust pathotype that came, that's been, um, that's been um, identified. Um, it will mean that the resistance, leaf rust resistance rating of varieties will be uh, potentially downgraded for some varieties. We need to basically be rechecking the um, resistance ratings for those varieties and be budgeting for fungicide. Now, when you're looking at those long season environments, uh, you'll be looking to manage for leaf disease. It really provides you with that extra protection against the leaf rusts at the same time. A lot of this information here is packaged in the Wheat Variety Guide and it will be available online and in the mail um, in the next week, a couple of weeks. Now, so I just want to uh, touch base. I've been asked by Dominie Wright just to also make mention that when it comes to leaf disease, the industry is being asked, we want to ask the industry on the type of training needs that are required um, for growers and for agribusiness. So there's a survey that um, Dominie Wright's asked me to um, ask, ask you guys to um, fill out to give us a better understanding of the, the, the um, training needs that you need for leaf disease. I'd just like to finish off that my call to action for you as an industry is to use the information that's been, that is available at these crop updates and in this presentation to help your clients make more informed decisions so that you can make the varieties that you're using the winning varieties. Thanks very much. Uh, David Gray, DAFWA. Um, one of the slides that you put up there showed that for magenta in high rainfall years, there seemed to be quite a strong response, at least, you know, limited number of uh, points on the graph, obviously, statistically difficult to come to strong conclusions, but quite a strong response to sowing time uh, as you got closer to, or you got further uh, into May, they, um, the yields were reasonably significantly higher. Can you comment on that and, you know, the, the time of sowing effect on, on magenta? Well, um, well the, if you look at this year with magenta as an example, um, and we had some research work that we did at Wongan Hills which, which showed a good expression of this, that the longer maturing varieties this year have actually performed really well and even with some of those later sowing times because we've had that late rain in, um, um, in towards the end of the season. So the longer maturing lines this year have actually performed really well because we've had such a big rainfall year and a lot of that rain also having, having fell, fallen towards the end of the season. So that's what you're seeing when, when, with those trials. It's, we're trying to pull out, get a really understand, a good understanding of the factors within those NVTs that have made that variety perform better at those sowing times. So it's got a lot to do with rainfall in the first instance, with those with magenta specifically. Uh, Christine, you just did a, uh, mentioned it right at the end, but could you just elaborate a little bit on the rust pathogen, that, um, the the risk there? Is that a risk specifically to mace uh, that I've seen in the press, or is it a risk to uh, a number of varieties, and could you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, 
There will be a risk to a number of varieties, not just mace, but I guess because mace has become such a dominant variety across the state, um, you know, it's something that growers will need to be looking to um, be aware of, the leaf rust. Um, I guess you're also thinking about where the leaf rust is a higher risk, so the south coast area. And I, I, should, I should just uh, comment that when I've spoken to Kevin Young about this work, he said that the new wheat variety of the future is mace plus fungicide. So that's uh, his comment there. But uh, yeah, the, um, the, the actual ratings that have been allocated to the varieties, I don't have. Um, I do know that in the variety guide, they have put an asterisk against them to say that we need to be aware that the, the resistances will be reduced for those, that pathotype. Um, just, just briefly on that, follow up on that question. We do know that, um, the, that wild catchment and Corax uh, rankings from last year will have reduced let me have a look at this piece of paper. Um, the wild catch and Corac are probably, you consider them an MS for leaf rust if, if that pathotype is present in your area. Um, and the indications were from last year that the new pathotype was quite widespread across the, the WA wheat belt. Um, so those two varieties, were, th those rankings are, are, are likely to drop to, to a sort of a moderately susceptible. Something like Emu Rock is probably a MSS. Um, and the story with Mace is obviously that what we know is that this pathotype uh, impacts on some of the major genes present in mace, but we're not entirely sure um, what will happen uh, with, say, APR genes that may be present in mace. So what our recommendation would be that, as Christine said, is to keep an eye out. Um, there's a likelihood that its ranking may drop, but that's not a guarantee, and uh, you really should be monitoring and, and uh, budgeting for the possibility that its ranking may drop somewhat. We've been some anecdotal evidence that maybe there's been some rust on mace, but uh, both Manisha at Dafwa and, uh, and the people at Sydney Uni are in the process of testing that adult plant response currently, basically.